Hello, hello, and welcome to Hometown Daily, Season 3, Episode 3 for January 3rd, 2024, and it still says 2023 in my show notes. I'll get to it eventually. I'm Marwat. that's hometown.com, and that, up there, the visualizer, up there. Up here? Yeah, up there. Up here. That's the sentient AI that keeps me out of trouble. And as mayor of hometown, a news aggregation website and uh, streaming news uh, service and host of incoming multiple shows starting Saturday. Going to add two more shows. And I don't know, I'm feeling pretty frisky so maybe two more will be added in the second week for saturday and sunday i don't know that one's gonna be a tough call i'm already getting a migraine thinking about it anyway today we're gonna be talking about uh around four levels a minute even in a meeting ai is replacing humans just get a hydro flask yes space competition celsius and fahrenheit meet in a bar could it have always been there self-doxing welcome to 2024 nonprofit executive salaries go up hello uber is baby driver available and what did that pecker say to me that and more did you like my lights going out i think that was great very dramatic <clears throat> production value so again i'm mayor watt that's hometown.com over there that's where we get all of the news i cannot i can't post this for promotion no matter how great it is because for whatever reason, the dippity doos that allow me to promote have, uh, because I have incidental political campaign crap on my screen. <laughs> hey, they actually told me this is, this is what they told me um, the other day. Just blur it out. Yeah, that's real handy, especially if it's on the side of an article or something. Yeah, exactly. They they literally just they they're like, yeah, 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 okay. We know that it's incidental and doesn't have anything to do with your show. You don't even talk about it. But still no. Yeah. Right. Fidelity I mean, context. Be, it sounds so easy, but it's really just not consistent. Well, with, uh, I mean, it's profit driven, you, do it. you know, they don't want to sit there and have to spend money on sitting there looking at it going, yeah, okay. We know that it's incidental because there's no way a human is looking through hours worth of streaming media when you promote it. So I'm not allowed to promote this because it has these two political parties mentioned, Ugh. But, but wait, I'm fair and balanced. I think they're all a-holes anyway you want to get into today's articles before i Sounds say too good. much uh the first article is over in the warcrafters channel after 34 years a 13 year old prodigy has become the first person to beat tetris by reaching the holy grail of high level play a true kill screen i'm not sure about prodigy i but they're saying prodigy so right uh if a then b so i don't know so okay sure over i'm not sure that qualifies as a prodigy but maybe the person actually is a prodigy and just happens to have beaten the original tetris by the way so three de decades have passed since tetris made his debut on the nes 1989 pretty amazing since then a holy grail has lied just out of reach the true kill screen now a young prodigy has managed to reach it after 
It says after 34 years, they already said it after three decades. 34 years, a flesh and blood person has finally beaten Tetris. You see, they've been using simulations to beat Tetris, but it's computer driven. And so not a human being. So that's how anybody beats it. <laughs> so Pretty much. what does that mean for the regular people trying to play it? Apparently they're not prodigies. So the article, oh wait, before I get into the article, let me throw this into the chat. So there you go. You can check it out. Um, so over at PC Gamer, Harvey Randall is the author. The uh, deck statement says Willis Gibson, AKA Blue Scooty, I think, or is it Scuddy? I'm not sure. I think it's Scooty. Made history last month. We're just now hearing about it. Um, yeah, so I watched this video. They use, it says here in 2020, hyper tapping was replaced by rolling. Rolling is done by applying pressure to the controller while drumming your fingers along the back of it, essentially making the button come to you. This allows a competitive player, cheese fish, to move blocks faster than any player had and soon it became standard practice. It also is murder on your hands, which is a big plus. So you basically just kind of tap, tap, tap on the back of it while your buttons are almost depressed. Not isn't sad, but almost pressed. Look at there. that controller. That looks so old school. Yeah, well, it is old school. This is the original. I mean, it's starting to kind of look a little old, but so amazing as this was, I, you know, I'm like, okay, I got to watch this. How did this kid do this? But I didn't get to see any of the controller motions. I didn't see it. It's just his picture in the corner and then him playing the game. And somewhere, you know, the, the, the rough calculation is somewhere four to five levels per minute to get to this point, right? Initially it was thought that the game's true kill screen kicks in at level 237 discovered by an AI playing the game. However, that AI was using a slightly modified version of the game's code. Luckily, Tetris Boffin Hydrant created a spreadsheet to suss out the earliest possible kill screen triggered by clearing a single line of blocks in the transition to level 155. As for the colors, a game scout explains the line of code that's supposed to determine the level color glitches out starting at level 138 and starts pulling data from outside the color table which results in some unintended, but super cool challenge levels. It's pretty cool. So they played for about 40 minutes, 13 year old, AKA blue Scooty or Scuddy, um, kicking blocks and taking names in professional tournaments. So what's interesting Where about is it is first I'm going to go from there. <laughs> if they're already doing that at age 13. Well, then all kinds of external pressures start kicking in and you just become uh, one of us, <laughs> you know, just a regular old person um, living life. So December 21st, 2023, the final attempt, Scuddy misses his first opportunity, clearing several lines instead of just one he needed. The next trigger point was on level 157, which has around 70% chance of causing a crash on a single line. Um, he presses on, nearly fumbling it. Then he clears a single line and he rolls the dice. The game crashes and Scuddy uh, makes Tetris history. You can watch the whole thing below. So, and there is a video. Um, he dedicated this to his dad um, who had passed away. And um, his grandparents made him a shirt. And it's up here at the top. This is Blue Scuddy. And then the winning um, some pretty cool grandparents. <laughs> yeah. Pretty cool. Um, so there you go. The first human to beat Tetris. What I don't understand, though, is that depending on how you clear it, that's what ends the game. Because, you know, an AI completed it at 200 plus. This one is the next trigger point at 157, but he had an opportunity at an earlier run 
or right misses his first opportunity clearing oh, several right. lines because like if you're really efficient you could end the game at like you could level blow past two it. or something but i'm not even sure if, uh like how that works right because it's like one line right because it says scuddy misses his first opportunity to to end the game at level 157 clearing several lines instead of just the one he needed so it wouldn't the game continue on i would think so because i thought if it wasn't cleared it's gonna keep piling up right and even if you clear it if you don't clear the one line it'll keep going but i don't know um so pretty interesting and, and like i know tetris i know how to play tetris but this to me uh, uh, a kill screen is you have beaten the game as far as it is calculable so pretty neat congratulations let's keep on going uh, seriously. So according to this article over in Technology Today, it's a channel over at hometown.com. AI can now attend a meeting and write code for you. Here's why you should be cautious. Microsoft recently launched a new version of its of all of its software with the addition of artificial intelligence assistant that can do a variety of tasks for you. Copilot can summarize verbal conversations on Teams online meetings present arguments for or against a particular point of view uh, uh, based on verbal discussion and answer a portion of your emails. It can even write computer code. It can oh present gosh. arguments. Can, can you imagine who are you having a meeting with and what is it telling that person on your behalf? That's insane. But my perspective is that it's kind of BS right now. I don't like the idea of an AI interacting with humans other than just like punting out some stuff and then being filtered by a human going, no, this is garbage. This is okay. Blah, blah, blah. But present arguments for or against a particular point based on verbal discussions and answer. How does it know what side you want? <laughs> Probably telling it, you know, hey oh, Siri, right. you need to be a jerk to my boss. <laughs> well, you might not tell it that, but it might do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so the article is over at Tech Explorer. Uh, Simon Thorne over at the conversation put the article together. Um, let's see here. This quickly developing technology appears to take us even closer to a future where AI makes our lives easier and takes away all of the boring and repetitive things that we have to do as humans. No, it's replacing humans and, and it's displacing them. It, it, it's not making lives easier. It's going to be making lives harder because there's going to be fewer jobs at the entry level. Plus, we have to at least currently undo what AI is doing. Right. Um, and then I think it's going to harm people that are not tech savvy, right? Because the jobs that are remaining presumably will require more tech. Right. I mean, people that don't understand this tech are basically the horses of yesteryear. How do you like that? Horses of yesteryear. I really like that if another article is in the mix. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. So uh, what's interesting about this is I just got done watching a video about a person who uh, generated over a million dollars in one year uh, using AI to create books. And the bulk of his uh, money was made not from the books. He made $300,000 from the books, but he made the rest of the money by selling the wisdom that he gleaned uh, about marketing said books, <laughs> but he used, he used AI to generate all of those books. 
some 40 books in three months, something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, LLMs, a type of deep learning neural network, are designed to understand the user's intent by analyzing the probability of different responses based on the prompt provided. So when a person inputs a prompt, the LLM examines it and out some BS and you have to go off and vet it. Yeah, it does actually make that sound. Um, I'm, I'm getting really deep into inner monologues and I think is the inner monologue of an LLM. <laughs> I can buy that. <laughs> Chat GPT, a prominent example of an LLM can provide answers to prompts on a wide range of subjects. Yes. However, despite it seemingly knowledgeable responses, Chat GPT does not possess actual knowledge. Its responses are simply the most probable outcomes based on the given prompt. And sometimes it's factually incorrect, legally dubious. <laughs> <laughs> That's being generous. <laughs> Not only are they coming for our jobs, but they're coming for your, uh, if you're an attorney, they're coming for your um, uh, law license. L- yeah, <laughs> license to practice. Uh, y'all, quit being dummies out there and trying to use ChatGPT to write oral arguments. So, uh, why reliance on AI could be a problem despite the seemingly intelligent responses, we cannot blindly trust LLMs to be accurate or reliable. We must carefully evaluate and verify their outputs, ensuring that our initial prompts are reflected in the answers provided. Uh, it's not really that it's about their answers are actually factually correct and not digital hallucination, you know? Hmm. Anyway, the article continues to talk about that kind of stuff, validation and verification. I, what I say is trust, but verify. Yeah. Let the LLM do the, or the, I should just say the AI do the work, but you're going to have to spend a portion of your opportunity cost on verifying what is spit out by this AI. Which then means you have to do it all over anyway, which that's what I don't really understand in its current iteration. Well, if it would normally take you, you know, a hundred hours to construct whatever the document is, an AI can do it in 15 minutes, even with coaxing it in the uh, format that you want it. And if you spend only five hours verifying it because it's all there, it's akin to a research, uh, a, a research paper being generated off of, um, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, <clears throat> I, I just forgot what the term, <laughs> I use it all the time. And I, and now my brain just like non peer reviewed, uh, information or something. Yeah. Um, uh, fundamental research. So if you do the fundamental research, you, literally are moving too fast to document all of your referenced material in your art in your paper in your research so you end up going back through history um citing sources that you as a subject matter expert understand and you you've used them in your writing but now you have to cite the source that it came from which is typically some document or a book that you have read in history um, and then you go through and you put your footnotes or you write a, um, a reference sheet, depending on MLA or APA or Chicago or whatever format you want, um, or whatever science dictates, you know? Um, so AI has a place. It can streamline the, the lives of every human being that enables it to be used. The only problem is businesses go, well, (laughs) I don't need 50 people. I need five because those five are skilled in AI. So punt. And no, it's not going to make lives easier and take away all the boring and repetitive things. It's going to force people to have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to retool, to understand technology that just three years, two years ago was a a glint in somebody's eye. Hey, 
Let's do this. Was that Altman? <laughs> that and a whole lot of other, you know, honestly, AI has been an area of research for a considerable amount of time and not, without trying to date myself, my first touch with AI was close to 30 years ago. Um, and over that period of time, I've interacted with people um, doing research in this area. Right. But I guess the main difference is it's absolutely been around, but has it really been publicly known like outside of the industry? No. And has it been publicly accessible? No, <laughs> no, by far not. And it's been very, very inferior in terms of its actual functionality. Um, that's why I am predicting in 2024 the launch of what is going to be referred to as a sentient AI um, here in the first quarter. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm not taking any bets and I'm not going to punish myself for missing this. Um, but it is a prediction. You know, somebody will sit there and go, if it isn't launched in the first quarter, then I'll eat that hat. No, I'm not going to eat that hat. I get right. enough fiber. I'm good. <laughs> Don't eat a hat. <laughs> With ketchup. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, this next article is over in uh, Omtown Daily. Hordes of people are stampeding stores to get Stanley's limited edition Valentine's Day cups and resales are going for more than a hundred dollars. Now, is this like the era of the cups? I mean, what is going on with these? What? Um, <laughs> I held mine up. So just get a hydro flask. You know, it's high quality, reasonably priced. You'll it's a buy once and never have to worry about it again. Just keep it clean. It has interchangeable cups or lids with all of the other formats of the the uh, if you get a 40 ounce one, the, the 40 ounce lid fits on all of the other 40 ounce ones. So I got this chunky uh, coffee mug, but then I have the exact same Stanley de formatted uh, style. You'll see it here in a minute. It's 40 ounces and fits in a, a, a car's cup holder. Um, not mine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, everybody else's your car design <laughs> <clears throat> yeah not sure why uh they designed the dash to be that snug to the basically you have to put a shot glass in my cup holders and that's about it yeah, they didn't expect those drivers to want to use any of the hot uh travel <laughs> hot, mugs hot new stanley valentine's day cups so Let's go take a look at this. It says Stanley has just released its limited edition Valentine's Day cups and people are losing their freaking mind. It's an article over at Business Insider. Tanya Chen is the author. The big difference between Hydro Flask and what's the other one? I keep blanking it out. Well, there's actually another one featured this week in hometown that I hadn't heard of. I think it was called Oak or something like that but the other one is yeti that i'm familiar with yeah yeti is the one that like all of the uh nature lovers always hike around with and stuff like that and so it has a premium price um i think higher than the hydro flask but that's anecdotal and and i really don't don't care about that um because you literally can buy this and you'll never have to replace it never i mean I know somebody who within the first five minutes dropped theirs and put a dent in it and it's being used all day, all night. I mean, they're impervious. Right, because it's basically indestructible, even when people try to destruct them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you got to get it out of your system, right? You can't be, you, you can't be um, kid gloving your drink. You just have to take, you basically need to buy your pristine, perfect mug and then just grab it by the handle and smash it up against cement buildings and slide it along until you get to your destination. And then you're I mean, like, it's the same uh, as having a new phone and drop kicking it down the stairs in the first five minutes of ownership. 
Hey, I didn't know that my phone is uh, built by Lego. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Stanley Cup hype has reached new heights with its limited edition Valentine's Day drop at Target. TikTok videos show customers standing in line for hours, then stampedes towards the, the products. Resales of the 40 ounce tumbler are already being listed and for $100 plus. I went and looked at 4090, um, uh, Nvidia 4090 uh, video cards. Yes. They're like at $2,600 now, $2,700 for just a, a video card. For a video card, that's outrageous. That seems outrageous for a whole system. Yeah, exactly, right? But n- now, now you get a video card and that's it for twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight hundred dollars. What do you do with it once you pay for that? You can't afford anything else. <laughs> and then, but then I wanted to just put this in perspective. Um, as the mayor of Ometown, I stream games and I do this and I'm in meetings all day long. I need a beefy video card. Um, is it in the budget for me to get a $2,800 uh, 4090 or can I get um, a couple of these Valentine's Day uh, 40 ounce tumblers for $100 each? I think the tumblers are a little more budget friendly, but it depends on how close to Valentine's Day you're trying to buy them on eBay. Because <laughs> they might start rivaling the... Uh, the video card prices exactly uh, but i wanted to throw that out there so that i could put pricing in perspective because you know maybe people really want these but my problem with this is people are buying a shit ton of them and then selling them for profit because they're too much of a greedy bastard to let people just enjoy the product buy it because they want it and need it or want to give it as a gift no they are making marginal profit, but that's because the MSRP for this was priced too low or it was because they priced it at a price point where they got their profit and it's approachable for pretty much anybody who has an extra 40 bucks laying around. But no, people have to buy a pallet of them and be an asshole. So anyway, Barber documented the mad dash to secure a 40 ounce Stanley Tumblr in one of the limited edition colors, Target Red and Cosmo Pink, and said the customers were starting to argue over them. The clip garnered 873,000 views. That right there is the reason why yeah, clips basically are the go to nowadays because a little snippet is basically an endorphin rush and then you go on to the next snippet uh, i'm telling you man this is the I, I sound like an old dude saying get off my lawn but <laughs> recording everything everywhere just for the hype the clicks the whatever but then again you look at it and you go wow man this is what society is doing there's so yeah, fear of what's missing wrong out with society. <laughs> yep, exactly. You can go anywhere and get any of these 40 ounce mugs. Just go and get something else. Nothing is that important to argue with people over a damn cup. It's not going to change your life. It's not going to solve world hunger. It's not going to prevent somebody from getting in a car accident unless they're not getting in their car because they're too busy arguing over Cosmo pink tumbler from Stanley. Oh, it's just so stupid. Well, and the PSA here is please do not participate in a stampede for any product. Man, who cares? I'm only talking about it because it's in, it's been aggregated by uh, our sources, and then we have the little snot, a snippet, snop it, little snippet of it. <laughs> snop it sounds like a, a muppet or something. <laughs> exactly. Um, so again, I am uh, suggesting that everybody just get Hydro Flask. It's gonna save you a whole lot of heartache because you know, it doesn't matter. And they have red ones too. Guess what I just did. Did now you just driving get up. One? The, no, I'm driving up the price of 
Oh, right. Hydroflask. Exactly. And pulling their availability from whatever site they go. All right, let's keep on going though. Um, this is actually the third article, so let me throw it into the chat. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, let's keep going. So the next article is over on the Mobile Channel, ULA's Vulcan Centaur rocket set to launch Monday, a challenge to SpaceX. Yay, United Launch Alliance Vulcan Cent uh, Centaur could finally perform its first flight. ULA has been a rock in the space flight industry since its founding in 2006. And with its pending launch, the company's ready to take its next bold step into space or obliterate itself on the launch pad. I guess we'll find out. That last part isn't what's said in the article. <laughs> uh, the article's over at Gizmodo. George Dvorsky is the um, author. The deck statement says United Launch Alliance 200 foot tall Vulcan Centaur blends power and flexibility. That's me in the gym, baby. Oh, um, here's what to know about its upcoming first flight. Hi, Gizmodo. So um, this thing looks chonky. Why does it look like a cigar tube on a stand? Yeah, it does. That's really kind of weird. Strange. Yeah, I thought it was just me. <coughs> oh, pardon me. The 202 foot tall Vulcan Centaur rocket is set to launch from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral. This is a huge deal as it marks the debut of ULA's first rocket design in 18 years, while the mostly expendable Vulcan Centaur may not be revolutionary from a technological perspective. It represents a significant evolutionary step for ULA, a joint venture of Lockheed Martin Corporation and the Boeing Corporation. Oh, the two big people in bed. Oh, so that's how it works. I guess it's just going to be kind of, it, it says like space planey. No, that can't be right. So the Vulcan Centaur rocket is vital for U.S. national security and commercial uh, space interests, whether it be for deploying critical reconnaissance satellites or launching innovative space planes. <laughs> they, we just launched a, this space plane that's going to be up in orbit for how long? Like years, right? Like it, right. It's designed to meet the requirements of the U.S. Space Force and intelligence agencies for national security satellite launches. Uh, but it'll serve, uh, it'll also serve as a launch vehicle for private space ventures, including 38 launches to deploy satellites for Amazon's project Kuiper. All right. So I guess we'll be watching this on Monday. Uh, although I think I'm going to be in meetings. That's okay. Right. I mean, I don't know why they don't schedule these launches when people aren't in meetings. But yeah, I mean, they need to contact me and just say, hey, is it OK? <laughs> exactly. Mayor Watt, do we have your permission to do it at this time? Uh, no, just wait. Uh, I've got 30 more minutes in this meeting. Next article is um, over in hometown daily. It's so cold in Finland right now that Celsius and Fahrenheit are the same find that kind of interesting apparently the calculation for this is minus 40 degrees is where they match up because celsius i didn't is even know they ever matched up um i guess well i mean if you don't run across temperatures where they where you interact you know down there at that <laughs> level well that's true we're like. not really experiencing that uh anywhere That's in the United range States of temperatures. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's really, really, really cold in Finland and Sweden right now, which is why Marwat is not there. It's so cold that Celsius and Fahrenheit are the same. That's minus 40 degrees. No, thank you. According to this article, which is from business insider, they recorded their coldest temperatures in the winter Tuesday when thermometers plummeted as low as 40 degrees, negative 40 degrees. They say minus, minus 40 degrees Celsius, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. By the way, Celsius it starts, it's pegged at zero is freezing, 100 is boiling water, right? Um, 
So at some point, apparently negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit and Celsius meet up. <laughs> don't you think the thermometer is kind of saying we just don't care at this temperature, like whatever <laughs> it's, it's 40, whatever, or negative 40, whatever. Yeah, really. If you come outside, you deserve what you get. I saw a video of somebody that opened their window and exhaled and all it did was turn to uh like snow it just oh wow it instantly froze I mean, their breath sounds miserable but sounds very cool to um watch and, and if you go over to youtube right now and um you look for um cup of boiling water instantly freezes or something like that you'll find videos of people where they've taken like a cup of uh water meant for tea and they just throw it and it just instantly turns into snow. Wow. Yeah. So Jerry Tanner over at business insider put this article together and I, I don't know how deep into this article we need to really go because I mean, it's in the title <laughs> cold and snow disrupted transportation throughout the region, including in snor in Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Would that be a snoppet? <laughs> uh, yes, I'm a snoppet in Norway, uh, including in Norway, where a major highway in the south was closed due to the weather. You know, you're in serious trouble when your road goes, I'm just too damn cold. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Ferry line suspended operation. Swedish train operators said the cold snap caused substantial problems for rail traffic. One of the most amazing things you'll ever see is a snowplow train. Okay, that sounds very cool and it sounds like something reminiscent of a snow piercer. Yeah, go and look up on, on YouTube, folks. Go look up like a snowblower train or snowplow train. It's amazing. This stuff is so cool. Um, that's probably the gig that if I had to be a train operator, I think that's probably the gig that I would enjoy the most because nothing seems to stop them. You're like, Oh, look, like if you ever open your garage and you're confronted with three or four or five or six feet of snow here in the United States, you're like, that's it. And you just put the garage door back down and call in Hey, I'm here until spring. Um, <laughs> one of these snowplow trains it just plows right into the snow and blows it away it's just a, it's so awesome to watch um and there's actually live streams of uh, these snowplow trains and, and trains in general in these nordic regions um, where it's a lot of fun and very peaceful to listen to it so uh i'm gonna try this nikolokta nikolokta um, a small village inhabited by indigenous Sami, I think, uh, people in northern Sweden recorded a temperature of minus 41.6 degrees Celsius or negative 42.8 Fahrenheit early Tuesday, according to a Swedish public broadcaster SVT. Yeah, that's, it's just too cold. Finland was similar. Um, what? The Norway town of Arendale. Oh, that's very interesting. Hmm. Uh, it's probably a Randall, but it's very. Yeah, it, but it, don't it, tell that to the Frozen fans. That's right, Arendale. Um, officials said schools would be closed Wednesday because it wasn't possible to clear the sidewalks in time for children to get to school. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, here in the States, just want to say here in the States, uh, there's a little bit too much water and schools shut down. Uh, what? Oh, right. <laughs> Threat of snow. Uh. <laughs> right. The weather is looking angry. We're going to shut down for delayed opening. <laughs> Four hours later, they go, well, there's a lot of standing water on the sidewalks. <laughs> of course, I have to say. I remember uh, wearing tiny little skis and going to school like uh, <laughs> and snowshoes 
and these uh, little attachments on my shoes that were um, spiky so that I could walk on ice. Um, Are those like crampons? Uh, no, I'm full. I don't need any. <laughs> uh, wait, did you say crampons? Yes, I did. Um, isn't that the what happens every 28 days? No, that would not be the same thing. Okay, well... Never mind. Let's keep on going. Um, I messed up this one, so we're going to jump right on over. The um, aggregator kind of uh, ate the data, but I'll correct this after the show. California retailers are now required to have gender, gender neutral toy aisles. Iman Palm uh, put this order together. Wow. And now I have um, like... Uh, no chance at all for me to promote this, but we'll see. I'm going to actually promote it afterward just to see what happens. Um, at least I'll be able to complain about it in the next episode. I probably won't complain though. Anyway, uh, major retailers in California now are required to have gender, gender neutral toy aisles under a new state law that went into effect Monday. The new law requires re requires retail Department stores physically located in California with 500 or more employees to maintain a gender neutral section or area to be labeled at the discretion of the retailer. So they're going to have like boy on one side, girl on the other side. And then in the middle, it's going to be everything. It's going to be titled everything in between. I don't get Wait, it. Why don't they, you know, maybe they could just make all of it not labeled as boy or girl gender, related gender toys, anything right it should right? just be toys yeah just accept people for who they are you know it, it's the reason why we have uh social movements for equity inclusion um <laughs> is because the Various people have been oppressed, suppressed. Uh, I, I just, I, I cannot wrap my head around why people are treated so poorly when we are all people. To the point where you have to enumerate gender neutrality when it really shouldn't matter what toy your kid is interested in. Yeah, that that's true. I mean, I know that some uh, stores made an effort toward gender neutral toys. Like I think they stopped labeling them, etc. Right. But this is fascinating that they're requiring this, which obviously gives you some hint of what's not happening voluntarily. Right, exactly. And instead of society just going, okay, everybody is beautiful in their own way. Let's just accept people for who they are. We have to enumerate it. So obviously the need is there because there are really bad actors out there that are sitting there saying, well, you're not a real human, apparently, unless you park yourself into one of these two genders. I don't know. I never grew up and, and this is anecdotal. I never grew up. Um, I'm sorry. I said period. Uh, yeah. Just leave it there. Right. <laughs> I never grew up. You know what I am. I'm going to leave it right there. So not all Californians, however, are happy with the new law. Jonathan Keller, president of faith-based California family council advocacy group, uh, previously expressed his displeasure with the bill signed into law in 2021 and golly if it isn't just the fact that wing nuts are the complainers of this you know if anything we should be with open arms N not trying to pen people in and oppress them and coming from oh, i just i there isn't enough time to talk about this stuff um 
I just, and I feel like if a kid wants to play with a toy, I don't care what the toy is, provided it's not dangerous or something. Right. You know, or too loud if it emits Here's a stick of dynamite. Like right. I mean, we and don't, a match. that's not obviously a good thing. But Oh, wait. Don't play with matches, but you can play with a stick of dynamite. That's fine. Oh, okay. Not, not both of them at the same time. So the law passed the state legislature and was signed signed uh, by Governor Gavin Newsom uh, in 2021. Retailers that don't comply with the law initially will be fined $250, followed by $500 for repeat offenders. And whenever I hear about um, you are subject to financial fines, it's literally pay to play. All you have to do is withstand the fee. And if the profit is greater on the other side of the fee, then it doesn't really matter. And you can't put a business True. in jail. For financial reasons, I agree. But where this could have a backlash is, for instance, a business that completely skirts this and their um, customers want them to do this. Right. I mean, that's where I could see it's not going to be the fines that are going to shape the behavior, at least for the larger retailers. Yeah. I mean, it's the social messaging. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 just, it, it bothers me. And <laughs> I'm just going to leave it alone. I, I, I end up kind of becoming apoplectic about it and, and, uh, You'll find me if I keep on talking about this today, right now, without like having a whole show dedicated to it, uh, I'll probably end up doing associative thinking and talking about something else. So let's, let's just move on. <laughs> so the next article is over in hometown daily An innocent looking Instagram trend could be a gift to hackers, according to a cybersecurity expert, but don't, uh, but users don't want to hear about it. Um, yeah, because they've been given the mantra that privacy is dead. Privacy is dead. Privacy is dead. Oh, you know what? I need to do something else real quick here. Let me grab this. Um, and yeah, the, the link to the source is still valid. Uh, just the article got a little crunchy. Well, and and one I... way to make sure privacy is dead is to put all your data out there. That's right. You know what? If you're going to commit to it, then just dox yourself um and in uh, serena bergman over at business insider put the article together so you'll never really guess what is actually the nature of this instagram trend instagram users are answering a list of personal questions to get to know me one cybersecurity expert warned it could make it easier to hack people's accounts. Viewers dismiss her warnings, but experts agree sharing even innocuous data can be risky. Um, so it says here, it's all down to a, a popular template of 11 questions that people are answering on Instagram, giving away information like their height and date of birth, various details about how they feel strongly about things, including favorite foods and phobias. The trend appears to have gained traction in late December, although similar templates have circulated on different platforms pretty much since the advent of social media itself. Yeah, it's even, it's been around since. I guess if you want to um, accept the fact that uh, back in the day, there used to be news groups. They still exist actually, but news groups out there um, had the same thing. BBS has had the same thing. Uh, we think of social media today as something bigger like Facebook or. Right. But I, I mean, don't you think that this isn't just people not paying attention to what they're putting out there? I mean, is it possible that somebody who is really trying to steal people's data is behind this trend? Um, could be. I mean, I like a good conspiracy and I mean, it stands to reason that, yeah, sure. Uh, but why yeah, I'm, it's really not a, a real question. Let's just assume that the people that put it out there are just security dummies and they don't care. 
because they're getting views and clicks and attention and the endorphin rush, you know, but I'll tell you a story. I've said this in the past, um, not just to you, but to the stream, I was challenged once by someone who said, there is no way you're going to be able to find me online. And I was challenged on a Friday and the Saturday night I had already located them because of personal information I knew about them that wasn't private per se. They, people knew about this person's, um, penchant for audiophile equipment. And so I l looked around for personally ident identifiable information beyond just name and uh, things like that, you know, and sure enough that weekend was an audiophile convention that he had gone out to and I found him in the background of a photograph wearing a red shirt with a gray star. And so I sent him the image and told him ta-da. And he goes, holy crap, how did you do that so fast? Well, <laughs> you're not so private, buddy. The internet and the world around you is divulging information. If you want to remain private, you basically shouldn't challenge grid, people. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but don't sit there and pick a fight. You know, you'll never find me. Yeah. Well, right. That's <laughs> going to invite more attention, I suspect. Exactly. Lay low um, and don't sit there and, and challenge the world. Because I've seen the Internet triangulate based on the angle of attack from the moon and the sun in, on a horizon out in the middle of nowhere because somebody did something that the world thought was pretty bad and... <laughs> Uh, found well, there them. are people on uh, like YouTube, right? That sure. that focus on that, and they're kind of like, okay, find me, and then they'll um, track the person down, just like you were doing. Yeah, it's kind of funny here. The person who had been kind of poo-pooing the idea of this being a bright idea, you know, basically self-doxing. Um, there, they say that. You shouldn't do, pardon me, you shouldn't do it. Well, her, her video received 1.6 million views, which is like more than the other one, but many of the responses seemed to dismiss her concerns. Comments accused her of reaching and wrote that it is a big step from sharing a favorite caller to a social security number. No, not really. A huge number of viewers also disputed her premise, saying the questions in the template did not coincide with typical security questions. That's not necessarily true either. But I can construct a letter and send it to somebody that I know is in your circle of friends and use personally identifiable data to ingratiate myself into your sphere of friends and then from there obtain other personally identifiable information. Now you might go, well, that's a pretty heavy lift. You got to be a target. Well, well, what do you think <laughs> people are trying to do that are trying to steal data? Yeah. So it says, in fact, it's unlikely most people have security questions at all. Lisa, uh, I guess, Plagamir, the uh, executive director for the National Cybersecurity Alliance, told Business Insider that the personal question system uh, as a way to regain access to an account when a user has forgotten a password has become all but obsolete. Yeah, that doesn't mean that all of the systems have been replaced by something other than uh, most companies have moved more to secure firms like um multi-factor authentication, push notifications, codes that get texted or emailed to users, etc. But that does not stop the human element from failing. If uh, I call in and I'm, I act dumb enough, the person on the other side might feel compelled to facilitate resetting my password in some way. Because, well, I just can't find this information. I don't remember. It's been so long, et cetera, et cetera. Humans are the weakest link, and uh, they're usually the cause for all cybersecurity-related issues. I mean, 
It wasn't the computer that injected the wrong type of data, allowed the wrong type of data, et cetera, et cetera. It was because it was programmed to allow for blah, blah, blah. So it's always the human. It's kind of like the excessive speed thing. 100% of all accidents are caused by excessive speed because somebody had to be moving to crash into the other person. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in the mobile channel. When newspapers close, nonprofit, nonprofit executive salaries go up way up. According to this report, um, it's over at uh, fizz.org, but let me grab it and throw it into chat there you go um kevin main or it might be man or matinee university of buffalo uh, again it's uh, posted over at fizz.org um, a long time ago i wrote a paper on um shutting down newspapers and uh, kind of allowing smaller papers that don't have the budget to go digital to still utilize the paper press um and I was kind of fascinated that businesses were really slow to move away, but a move away they did. And only the biggest really survive and the smallest, which are kind of like, um, what do you call them? The uh, passion project kind of newspapers. Um, oh, those right. still exist. Lifestyle business. Yeah. So it says here published in the journal of accounting and public policy. The study found that when a, newspaper goes out of business total executive compensation at local nonprofits goes up by more than thirty eight thousand dollars on average an increase of nearly 32 percent donors and volunteers expect their contributions to go to the execution of the nonprofit's mission rather than leadership salaries so unreasonably high compensation represents a serious problem for these organizations, says study co-author Joshua Cavis, PhD, assistant professor of accounting and law in the UB School of Management. Newspaper closures exacerbate problems within these agencies, particularly when they lack internal governance and auditing. A news, uh, I'm sorry, but a not-for-profit still has a board. Right, it does. And... <laughs> Well, I, we've talked a lot about the nonprofit um, attached to OpenAI. They still have fiscal responsibility. What is the board doing? <clears throat> and literally the sole job of the board is to hire the CEO or the director of the not-for-profit or nonprofit and then set That's true. And then standards. that person handles everything else, right? Yeah. And they report back financial status and all that to the board. Um, but it's not up to the board to dictate anything. It shouldn't be up to the board to dictate anything in the fiscal responsibility, like processing of day-to-day -day operations, because it would, uh, it, it subverts the role of the director or CEO. All that liability in daily operations should be borne by the C-suite and subordinates. The board should just be sitting there saying, this is what we expect of you during this fiscal year or this quarter or whatever the milestones are. Um, but they have fiscal responsibility, i.e. if they get a quarterly report and they see that there's a downtrend, they should be asking questions what the objective is to turn this boat around, not just let it go and then go, hey, a newspaper just went out of business. Let's jack your salary up $38,000 on average. None of this makes sense so far. So they say in the article to provide a comprehensive analysis of the relationship between local business closures and not uh, nonprofit executive compensation. The researchers ran a series of tests using financial information of nonprofits from 2008 to 2017 obtained from the IRS as well as local newspaper closure data from previous research studies and from the University of North Carolina Center for Innovation and Sustainability in local media. So I love this. I might have to go and check that out. Um, their findings show that 
nonprofit executive spending increases the same year a local newspaper closes and that persists over the next three years. I think that is very interesting. But why? Suggesting that the increased compensation is not due to increased performance, but rather the loss of the monitoring newspaper. Oh, whoa, that is amazing. Oh my goodness. There's no, um, uh, investigative like journalism monitoring. Oversight. Yeah. Yeah. That no external interest. Wow. <laughs> I wonder how they got the idea for this. Somebody tried it and everybody else was like, oh, that was a fantastic idea. This is, this is pretty amazing. This is interesting that they discovered this link. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they must have seen something. They must have heard something. Oh, I thought you meant how did the nonprofit get the idea, but I think you meant the research. Both ways, really. That, I mean, I'm glad that you, you took it the other way. Right? How in the world that, okay, somebody has to be in that industry and realize, oh, something hinky is going on. So that's really amazing. So, hey. Again, this this bolsters my claim that ethics is the smallest chapter in any operations uh, employee manual. Hey, look, we're not being looked at anymore. Let's jack up the prices. You know, that kind of thing. Spectacular. Well, there you go, hometown citizens. Keep an eye out and you will find an opportunity to exploit. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's the wrong message. Wait, what? <laughs> Um, the next article is over in hometown daily burglary suspect arrested after calling Uber to flee crime scene. According to the cops <sighs> quote, it may not be the best idea to give an Uber pickup, uh, have an Uber pick you up at the crime scene. The police department said on social media. So this article is over at uh, newsweek.com. There is an actual video. Apparently <laughs> doesn't this slow down your getaway? Maura Zurich is the author. Well, that's why I titled this Hello Uber is Baby Driver available. So <laughs> if you don't know about Baby Driver, they're basically a getaway driver. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. It's a fun watch. That's for sure. But come on, Uber. Hey, uh, take me to this address and step on it. Wow, we've got a police escort. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And then tell the Uber driver, don't worry about the flashing lights. It's a police escort. <laughs> <laughs> They're chasing a felon. <laughs> that Uber driver is sitting there going, are you the felon? Well, and it's like, don't worry about these bags of money or whatever the the merchandise is right so this apparently they took must place have brought in... the stolen items with them yeah there's like a police oh, body like cam TV, footage right like let me put my tv in the vaccine of the uber <laughs> or whatever i don't know do you have any bags <laughs> yeah these two filled with money <laughs> <laughs> So uh, police body cam footage shared on social media on December 29th by the Wheat Ridge Wheat Ridge um, Police Department shows the bust. Police said the alleged crimes and subsequent arrest occurred the day prior to or at a business in the city of Wheat Ridge, Colorado, which is less than 10 miles from Denver. Oh, thanks for clearing that up. In a post sharing the footage in, to both uh, Facebook and formerly Twitter, the uh, Wheat Ridge Police Department said that they wouldn't recommend using a rideshare service as a getaway vehicle. <laughs> uh, so there was a burglary. <laughs> Actually, they should recommend that. Yes, exactly. Like we have a point to point, right? Um, route yeah. mapped out. I mean, We've got exact time stamp. I mean, it could actually work pretty well for investigating these things. Uh, they pulled the uber over and then 
the person in the car provided a fake name and they found in their backpack $8,600 worth of Milwaukee brand tools that were stolen from a plumbing uh, company, Blue Sky Plumbing. There's your ad. Um, this is really meta, you know, they worked really hard. Hey, could you commit this felony for me so I can advertise my business? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's the long... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the long, long play or there, whatever. Right? Yeah. yeah. The suspect was taken back to the police department where fingerprinting um, scanners confirmed his real identity, so they must have had a rap sheet. Or maybe the driver's license. Um, or maybe they, they like to take Uber every time they commit a right. crime. So I uh, said that he was looking for an Uber. Uh, no, the suspect said in the clip before putting his hands in his pockets. What? Shows the man denying that he was waiting for a ride after being asked if he was looking for an Uber. Uh, no. He appears to try to leave. Police order him to stop. Once the man is in custody, officers inform him he matches the description of a suspect. I like that. That statement probably came across like, you match the uh, description of a suspect. <laughs> what me? There, there is right, my hands don't have uh, exploding ink or whatever on them. That's right. Yeah. No. Everybody has um, a little name plaque above their head uh, for police, and it says felon. Yeah. You know? All right, let's keep on going. We have one more article for today. And uh, before I do that, I got to throw this article into the VOD. There you go. That'll be in the show notes. Um, the next article is in the Mobile Channel. Chicken Whisperers. Humans crack the clucking code. We've run across these kind of things periodically. Like somebody yes, has but not for chickens. decoded for cats or dogs or dolphins or whales i think whales was the last one I think um, so. this one is a university of queensland led study has found humans can tell if chickens are excited or displeased just by the sound of their clucks you know what i don't think chickens give a cluck they're well they might not they're just a big bunch of peckers and they don't give a cluck chicken whisperers Humans crack the clucking code. University of Queensland is the source. Uh, well, I mean, it's published over at fizz.org, but. <sighs> okay, wait for it, folks. You're going to want to hear how I end this. In the study, we use recordings of chickens vocalizing in all different scenarios from a previous experiment, Professor Henning said. Two calls were produced in anticipation of a reward, which we called the food call and the fast cluck. Two other call types. How much types. do you think they were laughing during their, this research project? Man. Well, if I was involved, <laughs> I would just be giggling through the whole thing. Two other types of calls were produced in non-reward contexts, such as uh, food being withheld, which we called the wine and gaggle calls. The uh, researchers played the audio files back to test whether humans could tell in which context the... Uh, chicken sounds were made and whether various demographics and levels of experience with chickens affected their correct identification. We found that 70 I'm rounding up. I shouldn't round that up in a, in a study, but 69% of all participants could correctly tell if the chicken sounded excited or displeased. I never want to be, I don't know. There's just something wrong with being able to say that I can identify a, an excited chicken. Uh, Professor Henning said the ability to detect emotional information from vocalization could improve the welfare of farmed chickens. Not if you don't have a soul. You know, farmed chickens. It, you know, if you, it, these companies that farm chickens and the people that produce it, first off, uh, you have to be willing willingly ignorant of this because if you know how the sausage is made you'll become a vegetarian um so the welfare of farm chickens basically amounts to what what treat them a little bit better while they're being farmed you, you really have well, to yes don't don't abuse them don't you know keep them 
pan, very penned in, etc. Yeah, well, I really doubt that anybody who's farming chickens thinks of them as anything other than potatoes. Um, because if you become emotionally connected to chickens, then, you know, uh, let's just say <laughs> you might have, have a psychotic break. In your business. Yeah. But you still shouldn't mistreat the animals, but I get what you're saying. Right. So, but my main point is I really doubt anybody who farms chickens really cares about the chickens. Um, so a substantial portion of the participants being able to successfully recognize calls produced in the reward related context is significant. Yes, I agree. Um, so it said this would allow for the development of automated assessments of comp compromised or good welfare states within poultry management systems. Ultimately, this could enhance the management of farm chickens to improve their welfare while helping conscientious far uh, consumers to make more informed purchasing decisions. Yeah. I only buy from chicken farms where they give them hugs each night by little tiny machines that just go cluck, cluck, cluck. Well, some consumers would only buy from that. <laughs> I'm one of them. I'm admitting it. Here's Mabel. And her coffee cluck. All right, folks, everybody get back into the party bus and we're going to drive down Main Street and get the flock out of here. You like that? You like that, right? Oh, you've done very well with the puns and uh, alliteration and everything on Ooh, this article, oh, I think. Yeah. So anyway, I am going to refresh this and who knows what's going to happen. Oh, God. Right out of the You I know what? I told you what it was at the top. Uh, <laughs> You know, risky click, full of regret. <laughs> wait, Oddly wait. enough, though, better okay. than the last batch, at least yeah. for advertising. It's all bad. I mean, for crying out loud. Anyway, that's it for today. I'm Mayor Watt. That's hometown.com. And that's the sentient AI that couldn't save me from myself today. See you in a little bit. You want to say bye to everybody? Good night, hometown citizens. We will see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern. Bye-bye. Thank you.